Okay, here's what I want you to do. If you're listening to this, do me a favor. Just close your eyes for a moment and think of the funniest person in your life who makes you laugh harder than anyone else does. Got it? Are you laughing yet? Good. Now, when I do that, I think of one person, and that's my brother Steve. I have four brothers, two older and one younger. The oldest is David, the second oldest is Steven, the star of the show today. Then there's me, Michael, and I have a little brother named Daniel. And they're all very talented, great, generous guys. But Steven is different from anybody else that I know. And of all the people that I've ever known, He is definitely one of the most extreme personalities. Ever since we were little, Stephen was like the king of irreverent humor. He was always drawing humor from sarcastic and inappropriate subject matter. But no matter how crass his comments were, (laughs) and they always were, he he was always... (laughs) really really funny (laughs) and his timing (laughs) was impeccable he was the most disobedient son to my parents growing up and (laughs) he really knew how to push my parents buttons (laughs) and it was hilarious probably not for my parents but It was absolutely hilarious, the stuff that he would do. And he was constantly getting into trouble. He drove my mother crazy. Like, my mom would tell us, do not do this, okay? And Stephen would immediately go and do exactly what she had told us not to. And that was funny. But what's even funnier is that he would do it in a way that he would just totally get busted. And then he would argue with my parents and like lie to them like he didn't do that outright, even though they just watched him do it. And I shouldn't laugh at that, probably, but it was always so funny. (laughs) He was like a real life cartoon character and he totally tested the patience of my parents more than any of us did. And it was hilarious. It's even funnier to think about it now. You know, time has gone by, he's gotten older, and he's matured a little bit. A little bit. And the years have kind of slowed him down a little bit. He still has that streak of irreverent humor that just cracks everybody up every time we're around him. So, while much has changed with him, it's great to see that much has stayed the same with him as well. In fact, to this very day, and by that I literally mean today, because I just talked to him. Steven is, still, hands down, the funniest person that I have ever known. And I have known a lot of very funny people. But Steven is so funny, still, that at this point, he doesn't even have to try. He doesn't have to say anything. He doesn't have to do anything. He just has to have that look on his face, like, You just know he's about to say or do something. You just know it. And you just start cracking up before he even does anything. Another thing about Steven's personality that's very unique to me is he's always had this affinity for anything that was alternative or outside the mainstream. And I mean way outside the mainstream. And an example I can give you really quick. He's always loved these obscure sports teams. For some reason, these teams that no one's ever heard of, nobody cares about, he's like a huge fan of these teams. It's almost like he is a devotee to the dispossessed. Another example I can give you really quick, and it's probably a better example, Metallica. Everybody knows Metallica. Well, a long time ago, before 
anybody else knew about Metallica, Steven was a huge fan. And I'm not talking about the Kill 'Em All days, I'm talking about prior to that, okay? He was a huge fan, and he was ridiculed for that by a lot of people. And those same people that were making fun of him for liking Metallica, three years later, were huge fans of Metallica. <laughs> so, in some weird way, and I can't even believe I'm saying this, but it's true, Steven is way ahead of the curve when it comes to certain things. Now, for all of his weirdness and all of this extreme personality that he has, he's also a really, really nice guy. I wanna make that clear too. He's a gentle guy, he's easygoing, and everybody who knows him knows that. He has friends today that were friends with him when he was just a little kid. And I can't say that about too many people that I know. And another thing I can say about him really quick is that he's an extremely hard worker and he gets things the hard way. He doesn't cut any corners. He has never been handed anything by anybody. He went to college and he paid for all of it himself and he double majored. So anybody who's gone to college and double majored, you know how hard that is. Well, while he did that, he worked full time and he worked a second job. He paid for all of his college himself, and he graduated from college with really good grades, and he went on to start his own business. And, and these are things that I've always kind of paid attention to. When Steven walks into a room, the room gets happier. He's that kind of personality. His will is good, and his spirit is good. But he's just got this streak of irreverent humor that is always there, and it's always really, really funny. Now, over the years, Steven has kind of earned a legendary status throughout everybody in my family. Cousins, uncles, everybody. Everybody knows that we can count on Steve to just say or do something at any time that will just get the whole house laughing. And I don't just mean giggling. I mean, we all laugh until it hurts. We'll be at a wedding or a funeral or some other kind of family gig, a family vacation even. It doesn't matter where we are at. It doesn't matter what's going on. If Steven is there, everybody knows they can count on him to say something that is so funny. And it's so funny that it usually becomes what people remember the event by. It would be like, Oh, I remember when Grandma died. Oh, yeah, that was so sad. I miss Grandma. Remember when Steve started to blah, 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 you know? Okay, let's see. What did Steven do at Grandma's funeral? <laughs> he... I don't even know if I should say this. Okay, this is like back in like 1983, okay? We we're just kids, and we're at my grandmother's wake. And truth be told, the funeral parlor didn't do a very good job with my grandmother, okay, at, at her wake. It, she looked not good and borderline creepy is how I would describe it. A little disturbing, maybe, for lack of a better term. I mean, we loved our grandmother very much, God rest her soul, but they just didn't do a very good job with her at the funeral home. And Stephen was so repulsed by her appearance that he started to get physically sick and he started to puke <laughs> okay so my cousin who is a year older than me and myself and my little brother are in the bathroom at this funeral home with steven and he's in the stall just puking his guts out <laughs> which is funny enough okay and in between hurls, he's laughing, <laughs> and we're laughing too. <laughs> so the, they have this Dixie cup dispenser in the bathroom, and we start feeding him Dixie cups of water, like we're trying to help him out. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> 
And of course, that's the worst thing to do when someone's throwing up because it just makes you throw up even more. <laughs> you know, we're in the bathroom for a good hour and a half while Steven's just ralphing his guts out. <laughs> that's how I spent my day at my grandma's wake. So when we talk about my grandma's wake, when grandma died, immediately, bam, that's the time that Steven was puking and he, okay, you get it. It kind of makes the memory of my grandmother dying not so sad anymore, you know. That's... <laughs> that's Steve. <laughs> and that's just one story. <laughs> oh my gosh, is he funny. Also, too, I can tell you this really quick. There was a woman that I was friends with a while back that I had originally met through Steven. And they were friends, and, and her and I were friends, but over time, her and I wound up becoming really pretty close. And we would go out pretty much every weekend, and we would go check out live bands together. She owned a music magazine, and she was a music critic, so you know she always had free tickets for concerts and stuff, and she would always ask me to go. So we would go, and after the show was over, we would go get something to eat, and we would kind of review the show and talk about what stood out and those kinds of things. But you know, after we got done talking about the band that we just saw, she'd always be like, "Oh, tell me a Steve story." So you know, I started to unearth all these old stories about Steven things that I had kind of like forgotten but they were just so funny like just one story after another about this guy and she just laughed her ass off I mean she would be like oh tell me the one when he about the time he did this you know and we would just both just laugh our asses off you know but that's how funny Steven is I mean people just love this guy and as funny as he is and as goofy as he is I mean there's this part of him that when he sets his mind to something he gets what he wants and that's from when we were kids up until this very day nothing ever fell into his lap except for the story that I'm about to tell you right now and this is where it gets interesting so back in like the fall of 1990 November of 1990 I was at my brother Dave's house, my oldest brother. I was at his house babysitting his kids for him and my sister-in-law. And they came home and the TV was on. And the news came on and there was this guy who was on the TV back then. Uh, he was kind of a local celebrity in Cleveland. His name was Dick Fagler. And he would do these commentaries on different political issues or public concern issues and things like that. Uh, you know, whatever was in the zeitgeist at the time, he, he would comment on it. And so my brother Dave and I are standing there talking and I'm getting ready to leave. And Dick Fagler's on the TV talking, doing his commentary. And all of a sudden, Dick Fagler says my brother's name. He says Steve Bostwick. And my brother Dave and I kind of stop talking to each other like mid-sentence and kind of look at the TV. Like, did he just say, Steve? Is he talking about Steve? So like, now we're paying attention. Like we're watching the screen and sure enough, Dick Fagler's going off about Steve and this piece of art that Steven had made and it was hanging in this exhibit. And he's kind of going like, oh, it's an outrage and disgrace to the college and they should remove this piece of artwork and they should stop doing this show and all this kind of stuff, right? Now, Dave and I are just totally freaking out. And Dave grabs the phone and he's trying to get a hold of Steve and he can't find him anywhere. And this is before there were cell phones or anything. Steve was nowhere to be found. Well, I knew that Steve was working as a DJ in a bar that was in downtown Cleveland. I'm like, you know, he's probably working. Let's go find him and we'll tell him. So Dave and I both jump in the car and zip on over to this bar that Steve's working at. And sure enough, Steve's working and he comes down to talk to us. And we're like, dude, did you make some kind of painting or something and hang it up at Cleveland State University? And he's like, yeah, I did. How do you know about it? And we're like, Dude, you're on the news, man. Dick Fagler's doing a commentary about you and how your artwork is an outrage and everything. And Steve just kind of like went pale. 
and his knees buckled and he sat down on the stage that he was working on and he just couldn't wrap his head around what we were telling him like he had no idea until we showed up and told him that he was on the news and that there was something happening around this piece of artwork that he had made now it's worth mentioning right here that nobody from cleveland state university not a single person called my brother to warn him that this piece of artwork that he had made was stirring up such a media frenzy like nobody called to give him a warning or a heads up or anything like that just saying and all three of us just kind of sat there like in total disbelief like we couldn't believe it and it really freaked steve out and if you know steve that's not a very easy thing to do so now we're really off to the races with this painting that steve did Okay, so really quick, I'll explain to you what the People's Art Exhibit is. Once a year, every year, at Cleveland State University, the art department of the college sponsors an art exhibit, and it's called the People's Art Exhibit. And the premise of the whole exhibit is to exercise freedom of speech. So the only artwork that's allowed into the show is artwork that is offensive, controversial themes anything goes and artists from all over the region and probably some from even out of state will submit their art to this exhibit and not everybody gets in now in this particular situation with my brother and his artwork the piece that he submitted was a piece that he had made in an art class that he was taking as part of his communications degree and he had made this piece in his classroom and his professor had taken notice of it. And he suggested to my brother that he submit this piece of artwork to the People's Art Exhibit. And so my brother did exactly that. He submitted the piece to the exhibit and that was it. He didn't really think anything else of it. So it's worth noting that his original intention when he first made the piece of art was not for it to be in this exhibit. It was his professor that suggested he put it in there. Just saying. So my brother has submitted this art to this exhibit, and wow. I mean, he just got so much more than he bargained for. And the news of this spread almost immediately nationwide. The Associated Press picked up the story and it was coast to coast it might have even been international i'm not sure but it was a pretty big controversy in the art world at that time and it was all swirling around my brother and now he was being compared to like robert maplethorpe my (laughs) my brother steve was being compared to robert maplethorpe So if that puts it into perspective for you, I mean, and you also have to kind of consider, at least for a moment, that out of all of the artists that submitted pieces to this show, my brother makes the piece that's so controversial that it makes the national wire. So just think about that for a minute all these other artists probably 200 artists maybe more from all over the place submitting the most controversial work that they can muster up and my brother unwittingly makes a piece that's so controversial that it makes the national wire amazing absolutely amazing that's the upside to the story But the reality and the downside to the story is this. Throughout this whole period, when this whole situation is going on, my brother Dave and I are kind of like his bodyguards, okay? We're kind of watching his back for him, okay? And there were reporters everywhere. It was insanity. And he was getting death threats. He was getting lawsuit threats. The college was threatening to remove him from the college if he didn't take it down. 
So my oldest brother and I were, in essence, kind of living it out vicariously through my brother. We were, we were on the ground with him the whole time. And the next thing that I can remember is that one day we were at the gallery and these reporters showed up and they interviewed my brother Steve, my brother David, my girlfriend at the time, and they interviewed me. And I was really just trying to do my best to defend my brother and his position, even though I almost totally disagreed with him. Uh, I didn't like the piece of artwork. It wasn't even something that I thought was good on a technical level. And I was just trying my best in a very blunk-headed, 21-year-old intellect kind of way to defend my brother. I wasn't going to throw my brother under the bus. I mean, I just wasn't going to do it. And I remember going home that night and watching myself on the news and just like, ugh, you know, damn, not good, not good. And that was really weird, uh, a weird experience because the, the media people were not objective and they were like animals, just no respect or concern or anything like that. And my brother Steve was really overwhelmed and truth be told, I think he was scared because it was really a lot bigger than he imagined it would be. And he really had a tiger by the tail. It wasn't fun. It wasn't exciting or anything like that. It was scary. It was the real deal. Now, my brother, in the heat of all of this craziness and under the threats of death and violence and lawsuits, finally caved in and took his piece of artwork down because the pressure was just crazy and he regretted it. I think he kind of, uh, he regretted backing down. He tried to put the piece back up, but the policy of the exhibit was if you take your art down, you can't put it back up. So that was it for the 1990 Steve Bostwick People's Art Exhibit experience. It ended on that level. It didn't end on the personal level. So he still had a lot of fallout from having gone through it in the first place. I mean, there were still threats and friends of his were turning their backs on him and even family members were turning their backs on him. I, of course, didn't. And I remained loyal to my brother. And I always will. Now, <laughs> as if this story weren't crazy enough, and amazing enough already. Fast forward to the People's Art Exhibit 1992. Same professor talks to my brother and suggests that he try again. Now, if you know my brother, this is a huge, huge mistake because now you're giving him creative license to go as far as he possibly can. And that's a huge mistake with my brother because he'll go further than anybody else. He's already proven that, but apparently he's a glutton for punishment. So, of course, the exhibit rolls around, Stephen enters a new piece of art, and bam, it just goes absolutely crazy. Like you can't even imagine, it was 10 times faster and 10 times bigger than the first time. I think Howard Stern was commenting on it. It was international. It made the New York Times. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Reporters coming to my parents' house and harassing my parents and extended family members. I mean, anybody with the last name. It was absolutely off the chain. And this time it was a little bit different for Steve because I think he was prepared for it a little bit more. I think he was a little pissed off that he had taken the original artwork down back in 1990 and he kind of wanted to make it right with himself. Like he was going to do it and leave it up and that's it, come what may. And wow, it was just 10 times worse than the first time. Now the second time he did that at the People's Art Exhibit, that was it for them. They it forced the whole organization to rethink the whole exhibit and to change their policies and to change their rules. And subsequently, since then, it can be argued that 
the People's Art Exhibit is now just a very diluted version of what it used to be. And it's because of my brother hitting the bullseye the second time. I mean, that, that was it. And that kind of sucks. And through it all, to my brother's credit, he kept his sense of humor. And he was probably at his funniest when this situation was at its peak. Even though he was afraid, even though he was intimidated, (laughs) he was still funny. And that's the end of my story. I hope that you enjoyed it. This is your host, Mike Bostwick, the brother of Stephen Bostwick. (laughs) And the owner of Pipe Choir Records, the place where all of your dreams can come true. Signing off for now. And remember, folks, if you want to keep what you've got, you've got to give it away. Take it easy.